Welcome to a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest is Professor Ganat Obasikra, who is Professor of Anthropology Emeritus at Princeton University, one of the world's uh, leading anthropologists. He is visiting the campus as the Forster Lecturer for the year 2003. He is the author, most recently, of Imagining Karma, published by UC Press. Professor, welcome to Berkeley. Glad to be here. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in Sri Lanka and also raised there, you know, and um, that's where I had my early education and my um, university education, at least for my BA. Mm -hmm. you know. And looking back, how do you think your parents shape your thinking about the world? Well, my father was a kind of, for that time, a kind of cosmopolitan figure. I mean, we, 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 he, he was born in a, a small village in the south of Sri Lanka, as I was too. And uh, as a young man, he went to India and um, he studied um, both Ayurvedic and, and Western medicine, but got his uh, degree in classical Ayurveda, that is Indian medicine. And then he, he came back to Sri Lanka and, and he taught there. So actually, he was fluent in about three or four languages, uh, including English. And um, we had the sense of a kind of um, a broad education as a consequence of that. So you were exposed to many cultures in a way very early. Well, in a sense we were exposed to many cultures because I mean I, I spanned the whole colonial era mm -hmm. to some degree. I mean I was born in the colonial period and I lived through the period of, of independence and freedom and so forth. So in that sense I was exposed to um, uh, the colonial uh, epoch, so mm -hmm. to speak. And uh, since my father knew English and Sanskrit and Hindi and Singhala and, and so forth, I was exposed to a wide range of languages, I would say. And my father was interested in um, Sanskrit or Indian medicine. And for that matter, I have written some articles on it too. So mm -hmm. there is all that. So a con continuity, one might say. Mm -hmm. And and how uh, how old were you at the time of the struggle for independence? Um, well, Sri Lanka was in a fortunate situation where uh, maybe it was an unfortunate one. We didn't have to actually struggle for independence. Mm -hmm. The Indians did all the struggling, and we sort of had <laughs> it on a plate, you know. Yeah. So um, this was uh, I might have been um, I don't know. Um, 15 or, or so when, when that happened. Was, was there an effect on you or did it just, the world change just one day? Uh, not at all. Uh, I mean, it, it, uh, it did have an effect on me. I mean, um, during the war years, for example, this was, uh, we got independence after the war. Um, and during the war years, uh, um, my education was uh, disrupted, you might say, in one sense, or enhanced, if you want to say, in another sense, because we had to move from school to school and so forth. And, um, and um, that I, looking back on it, you know, I, I found that a good experience. You know, it was sort of a broadening of my mind going from one place to another. It was all this all in your your home country, or did it, you? Yeah, it's yeah. in my home country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And and uh, so you did your undergrad, what we would call the undergraduate education in Sri Lanka. What uh, what is that when you got interested in anthropology, or was it later? Um, well, actually, uh, I mean, if I, if I could switch back a little bit. Yes, I was please. A terrible high school student. I you see. Know. Okay. And I always tell my children. Uh, look here, all you want to, um, you know, all you learn in high school, you can pick it up in six months later on. <laughs> but fortunately, I, I managed to get through my, one might say, scrape through my Scra university entrance exam. Yeah. yeah. But when I went into the university, I, I think that was a wonderful experience. And, um, and I moved into English literature. That was my major, mm. you see. So this was a period in, um, yeah, um, European intellectual thought where there was a certain amount of ferment 
with the new criticism coming in, you know, in, in, in uh, England, in Cambridge and Oxford and uh, in Cambridge in particular, you had a great literary critic, F.R. Lewis, right. you see. And our teachers were students of F.R. Lewis, so we were sort of, one might say, educated in, at that time, uh, the most powerful sort of literary critical movement of the time. And uh, it was through my, it was through my literary education, and it's tremendously bored, though, it was, though we call it English literature, we read a heck of a lot of uh, European literature, Ibsen, French literature, uh, and so forth. So it was b broadly comparative, one might say. And, um, but this was a time after all people, Eliot was writing The Wasteland, and people are talking of myth-making. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even in my lecture yesterday, I was talking of um, Yeats, who was in, in some sense a great myth-maker. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think I got very interested in anthropology through this bizarre source, through mm -hmm. literature, through Fraser. Because remember, um, Eliot used Fraser and Weston and so forth, people we hardly read nowadays. Yeah. But that's the way I got interested in anthropology, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and also through collections. This was a period in which uh, people were collecting Scottish ballads, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So I was infected with this kind of early romanticism, one might say. Mm -hmm. So during weekends, what I did was I used to take um, a train ride in, in, into a, a distant place, get off the train, um, wander into villages and so forth, um, go into a Buddhist temple, stay the night there, chat with people. And I used to collect folk songs, hmm. you see. And I still could rattle off hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of uh, Sri Lankan Sinhalese folk songs, mm -hmm. you see. But that gradually drew me into village life. Mm -hmm. So very early as an undergraduate, uh, several of us started a journal which was called Sanskriti in mm -hmm. Singhala. Mm -hmm. And Sanskriti means uh, culture. Mm -hmm. So you can see culture in the sort of um, Arnoldian sense or, mm -hmm. or T.S. Eliot's sense of culture, mm -hmm. you know. But that sense of culture in some sense drew me into anthropology, particularly the village experience, collecting uh, folk material, you know, uh, and also a kind of romantic looking back into my own past because I was born in a village. At age four, we went to the city of Colombo, the only big city then as well as now, and um, went into sort of private schools, what you might call. So in some sense, I was trying to look back into my past. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, in a, in a sense, virtually everything I wrote is in some sense a reflection mm. of Sri Lanka, you know, mm -hmm. my own past, my own history, mm -hmm. as well as the history of the nation. Even when I'm writing something, let us say, on Captain Cook, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And, and what, what would you describe as your intellectual and emotional stance toward what you were doing? Was the, was, was the motivation to preserve, to understand the complexity, or these things and more? Uh, in my early, uh, yes, in, in it, my early forays? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In my early forays, it was, um, <laughs> I almost, I'm ashamed to confess, it was almost antiquarian, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a horrible term to use, but in, in a sense, I was trying to collect these things, uh, because you were first, you were first confronted with the impact of modernity in the country, after all. Mm -hmm. And we felt that something is going to get lost, hmm. you know. And I, I, I presume that's the same motivation that led Alfred uh, Lord and other, other collectors, you know, uh, to deal with uh, European ballads and epics and so forth. Uh, that was the spur uh, that led me in my early years, mm -hmm. you know. And then your, your graduate education was where? Well, when I graduated from the University of Sri Lanka, one of my professors, um, who was really a student of, as I pointed out, of F.R. Lewis, he 
he said, why don't you join the English department at that time, which was ha the, probably the most prestigious department, mm. you know, given mm. the colonial period. Um, and I refused, and um, he sort of said, that's nice, you know, you're one of the first people who refused this kind of thing. And um, I got a, um, I applied, um, I got several f scholarships. I mean, I could have gone to London or to Oxford, you know, because I, I, I headed the, uh, the list of um, graduating students, so I had uh, automatic scholarships to go to London or Oxford, but I had this sneaking sort of anti-colonialism, which I still have, sneaking kind of way. Um, and uh, I refused to go the way uh, of others, almost mm. everyone else, all the sort of, you might say, the left-wing leaders of Sri Lanka all went to London or Oxford or Cambridge, you know. Mm. But I thought, that's not my way, and I went, um, I applied for a Fulbright. Everyone was horrified. My, my father was horrified. My relation was, well, you're going to America, you know? <laughs> I mean, this is some sort of terrible thing. It's not going to Oxford or, or Cambridge, you, you, yeah. you see? So I got this Fulbright, and I went. Um, I applied to um, Harvard, Chicago, Princeton, Yale, and I got the University of Washington in Seattle, you know? So that's how I um, first went there. But in between, in between, there was a sort of liminal period, one mm -hmm. might say, a couple of years after I graduated and before t um, taking up my Fulbright. And I had to have a project, so I studied working on some very interesting rituals, particularly the mm -hmm. Mother Goddess cults in Sri Lanka. And since I was a Frazerian at that time, I had no idea that one should go to a village and stay there for a whole year mm -hmm. and study the village throughout his yearly cycle. You know, mm -hmm. that was the anthropological model of which I was not aware. Mm -hmm. I was aware of the Frazerian model where you went all over the place. So at that time, I had a terribly old um, web core tape recorder and so forth and um, a huge battery and converter and uh, went from place to place in um, military trucks sort of uh, abandoned by the British, you see, mm -hmm. and um, went recording these mother goddess skulls all over the country, mm -hmm. you know? On reflection, I thought, what a haul this was, you know? <laughs> I would never have done that. I would never have got this massive haul of data if I followed the conventional anthropological model, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I used some of the material for my masters and then Later on, I used that for my work on the cult of the goddess Patani, you know, which is a kind of comparative study of a single cult, intensive cult, all over Sri Lanka and in South India. Mm -hmm. uh, help us understand what uh, uh, it takes to be an anthropologist and, and, and do that work. What, what, what are the talents and skills uh, that a student should understand uh, it, that are, are necessary uh, for being an anthropologist? Well, I hate to pontificate on, on this, this issue because it seems to me that different people um, have different sort of stances on this whole thing. My own guess, coming from my own experience, is, is, is somewhat different from the conventional anthropologist. After all, um, the normal anthropologist, you might say, is someone who is either in Europe or in France or in England studying another culture which he does he was not nurtured or socialized in. Mm -hmm. In my case there was a this was entirely different, you know. And I was studying in some sense my own culture, but through the prism of an anthropological uh, detachment, one might say, which was, to me, necessary at the time. So I would say that it was not all that different from normal anthropology in some, because I was raised, though I was born in a village, I was raised in an urban situation. I went to schools with, in which the primary language was English, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were discouraged uh, to speak our own language, singular by our English uh, teachers. So going back to study villagers was in a sense 
to understand my own culture, which is not quite the thrust of conventional anthropology. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the villages in which I worked were, in a sense, sort of different from my urban lifestyle, my urban education, my middle class background, my, the fact that for the most part I spoke English at home, you know. Mm -hmm. But but then later, I mean, you, uh, did, did you remain the same kind of anthropologist uh, in your later work, or uh, or, or were you uh, beyond acquiring the professional skills? Obviously, that your graduate education gave. You, how, how much is changed in the way you do your work? I think um, I haven't reflected on on, on this. I, I had to wait till I write my memoirs. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Right. Well, this will uh, be the beginning. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> to work. deal with this kind of thing, but um, uh, sure, you know, certainly I've changed uh, uh, quite a lot, I assume, uh, over the intervening years. But in one sense, I really believe, we say when, when we were graduate students, we were, in a sense, uh, sometimes taught explicitly, sometimes implicitly, that it won't do to study one's own culture, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't. I don't believe in that at all. I mean, um, I think that is a, uh, studying one's own culture um, is not a bad idea through the kind of anthropological lenses, you know, uh, with a certain amount of detachment. And I see this coming back in full circle right now, where you have my own students in Princeton now going to study their own cultures. Mm. You, you you see, mm -hmm. in a, in, a, in a sense, either either American culture or European culture and, and so forth. So, so I would say that uh, doing anthropology has certainly expanded my consciousness to a certain degree, broadened my outlook. Um, in a sense, uh, I, you know, a, co a cosmopolitan being mm -hmm. in, in some way. And, and that's due to my anthropological education. And, and which theories and theorists have, have influenced you most? Obviously, parts of Freud's work, uh, 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 even to criticizing it, is, is, is one thing one see. Who, who else? And, and tell us a little about Freud's influence on you. Well, Freud's influence was, um, again, came through my uh, literary Mm. Interests, you know. Mm. I mean, after all, Freud was um, a figure of the literary imagination, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, I would say, even before he was a product of the anthropological imagination. You know, he was um, people interested in literature were also interested in Freud, as they were interested in in Fraser. So, I read Freud when I was an undergraduate. I read Finnegan's Wake when I was an uh, not, you know, in high school. I read Ulysses. Mm -hmm. So we had a tremendous education in European literature, and that include people like Freud, you know. So, not that I understood Freud very much, but through Freud, um, uh, 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 you know, I began to understand something I mentioned even in, in, in my lecture last time, that uh, the Sri Lankan Oedipus is like the Greek one, you know. Mm -hmm. So, through Freud, I began to understand um, my own, my own background, to, you know, my own um, uh, situation in, in Sri Lanka. I was, a, I was a great rebel mm -hmm. as a young man. You know, I mean, I, I, I used to, um, and almost never stay at home, uh, wander out in vill villages, mm -hmm. even even as a young person. And I, and I, and, I, and Freud helped me to understand my own rebellious, Oedipal kinds of uh, mm -hmm. feelings. Uh, so. In that sense, Freud was not simply a kind of intellectual um, mentor, one might say, but also someone who helped me to understand my own emotional conflicts. You know, mm -hmm. one might as well state the truth of that, you, mm -hmm. you see. And um, when I, in my early work, therefore, um, I tried to bring Freud into the picture. And the University of Washington helped me a lot, um, because at that time, in anthropology, when I first went there, um, there was an anthropologist, Melville Jacobs, who was very much interested in American Indians and Freud. 
I'm afraid Jacobs was uh, really a very imaginative writer, and very few people re actually read him now. And I went into the to uh, for classes in the medical school mm. uh, at the University of Washington, and Gert, Gert Heilbrunn, who was a kind of Viennese emigre, was a Freudian, a uh, very standard kind of Freudian and a charismatic kind of teacher. So I learned a heck of a lot from him. And after a while, Mel Spiro, whom I mentioned in, in my class, also came in, but that was during the latter part uh, of my stay in the University of Washington when we were, when I was doing my PhD, you know. And uh, uh, Mel was a very strong uh, influence in encouraging me in, in the Freudian direction. And, um, and I like Freud for other reasons too, that he was a great, wonderful writer, you know, as Thomas Mann put it, you know, he was a stylist, even in English translation, mm -hmm. you know. What uh, other theorists that that uh, that that uh, uh, emerge as important either in your development or later, or as people who you deal with as as you achieve stature in the field? Yeah, along with Freud, you see, um, was my interest in in Weber. That kind of came in much later, mm -hmm. you, you know, and um, and my PhD dissertation was not at all Freudian, you know, mm -hmm. simply. I mean, this was a, perhaps a sign of perversity on my part, or, or, or tactfulness, you might say, mm -hmm. that um, the dominant paradigm at that time when I was in the University of Washington was British social anthropology. Mm -hmm. And British social anthropology was very anti-Freudian, you know. Um, American anthropology was very sympathetic to Freud, as you well know, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, not uh, British anthropology. So, British anthropology was very much interested in social structure, um, uh, the study of kingship systems and so forth. So, my first foray into conventional anthropological field work, you know, uh, where you spend some time in, the, in, a, in a particular village, uh, was a study of kingship and land tenure in a remote village in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And there I brought in Max Weber. Mm -hmm. You see, Weber became a very powerful influence at that time. And later on, I began to read a lot more of Weber. And I saw a kind of uh, emotional affinity to, to my own uh, interests. Um, intellectual affinity, I would say. I mean, Freud was more emotional af affinity. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my interests at that time was to use Weberian ideas of culture, you know, as a kind of system of meanings by which human beings relate to, relate to the world. And also some we uh, Weberian methodology, the notion of ideal types, which again I have resurrected back in my most recent work, you mm -hmm. see. So Weber and Freud became so the sort of sort of uh, the foundations, one might say, of of the beginning of my uh, anthropological career, and they are they are there to some extent. Even you know they have they have, have transformed Weber through Wittgenstein and various other influences in my life. Mm -hmm. And any other theorists that uh, we should mention? Or? Yeah, there were uh, many other uh, theories that. Um, um, I, 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 I was interested in Evans Pritchard, for example, uh, because Evans Pritchard, from a long time, um, presented an idea to which I was highly sympathetic, namely um, that anthropology is history in some sense. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I feel that however much, um, you know, uh, positivism has um, impinged on uh, anthropology very early. Um, at that time, my first book was called Land Tenure in Village Ceylon, uh, a sociological and historical study, you know. Mm -hmm. So history became a very, very crucial element in my own thinking. And in a sense, that's natural, isn't it? I mean, after all, I'm a Sri Lankan, um, though I'm an American citizen too. Um, I'm a Sri Lankan, I'm born and raised, and uh, uh, to me, uh, getting in interested in my own past was very, very uh, uh, relevant, you know. So, so through Evans Pritchard and other thinkers of, of that same sort, I, I became very much interested in history, and that's not 
alien to uh, to Eva either, you know. Mm -hmm. And and what what I'm hearing you say is that that uh, at at the core of your work is a an interdisciplinary sensitivity that 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 your your work uh, as an anthropologist really reflects uh, 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 all sorts of sources in in terms of of the influence of theory from. Uh, Weber was a sociologist, obviously Freud was a psychologist, and so on. And, and that, that is a kind of a, 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 a enriching for you as you do your anthropology. Yes, indeed it is. As, as a matter of fact, my, some of my, I, I would add, add to that and say that uh, right through my literary interests are there. You know, I, in a sense, I, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not a professor of English literature, you see. <laughs> I rather read literature for fun, and to some extent, uh, literary uh, writing, um, and I, 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 I don't know. I try to write well, you know, mm -hmm. and li uh, and literature has been a real passion for me, a personal passion. Uh, when I have a shower, I can quote, you know, reams and reams of poetry. I mean, I still can. Mm -hmm. So, um, and storytelling, t you know, has become a part of my interests, mm -hmm. particularly my recent work on, uh, on, on what I call cannibal talk. I'm very much interested in how people invent stories, what mm -hmm. I call narratives of the self. So storytelling, uh, which after all is something I was nurtured uh, as a child, you know, in Sri Lanka everyone tells stories. Um, the, the women who brought me up told me stories, Buddhist stories. Then in my, uh, you know, intellectual career I, I was reading novels, fiction, poetry and so forth. So storytelling too is a part of my um, intellectual baggage, one might say. Yeah, you you must have been positioned to to uh, the ways in which Western social theory could get things wrong yeah. because of a lack of empathy or understanding yeah. uh, with the setting where the problem was being said. Tell us a little about that. And, and how you dealt with those tensions and how you came to realizations like that. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that again is a, a sort of difficult question to answer because it permeates my work to such a degree. I would say it cuts both ways. On the one hand, I'm very critical of the way sort of, uh, you know, European scholarship approaches the other you know, third world cultures, including my own. I'm very critical of that way. Uh, and also critical of my own culture, you see. Particularly, uh, I'm terribly unpopular in, in Sri Lanka in some sense, at mm. least among sm small groups of people, because I'm very critical of, of the nationalism, nationalism in the country, you know. The nationalism that led to this sort of terrifying war in which we are now implicated and unfortunately having a, a, a breathing spell right now. So I am both critical of the Western um, attitude to the other as well as our own attitude to the West, you know, and trying to pretend that colonialism, for example, some extreme nationalists say colonialism has had no impact on us. We have the same Buddhist culture going right through. When I try to point out in uh, several of my works, including Buddhism Transformed, and in this book, you see that in some sense, the Buddhism that we now believe in is a colonial product, you see. It is a product of Western theorists and translators of Buddhist texts mm. who came in the 19th century and, and I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, you know, but it led to a transformation of ethics, the transformation of the way we look at the world in Sri Lanka. And it is foolish to deny this uh, colonial impact. I am a product of that too myself, you know, as I sit with you, speak in English, trained in English literature, you know, mm -hmm. and so forth. So why deny this, you see? Uh, at the same time, I don't want to sort of uh, uh, sort of whitewash the colonial enterprise as uh, and a lot of my work, the work on Captain Cook, for example, and the work I'm now doing uh, on what I call cannibal talk, is the way the European looks at the other, mm -hmm. you see. 
And can you well talk, uh, when it appears, I hope it appears soon, mm -hmm. we'll deal with that issue. So is the cookbook. Mm -hmm. Tell say. us a little about the cookbook, because I, I know it, it, it was, it's a really an important work. Well, a cookbook, in some sense, was an attempt to be critical. All this time I've been critical of my own, mm -hmm. uh, own country and the way they have uh, framed Buddhism and so forth, you know? With the cookbook, I, uh, I move into a kind of critique of the way in which um, European scholarship has looked on the other, you know, mm -hmm. third world people and so forth. So the cookbook really deals with the phenomenon of this great explorer, Captain, who, Cook. Captain Cook, who then goes into, at that time, the last part of the known world, you know, after all, mm -hmm. the rest of the world was fairly well known and mapped. You, he goes into Polynesia, I mean, he's a brilliant, great figure. I, I, I don't doubt that at all. I call him Prospero in mm -hmm. one sense, you mm -hmm. see, uh, you know, trying to discover new worlds. And, and, and one of the interesting things is wherever he goes, he brings English animals, you know. Mm -hmm. He plants a landscape with English uh, trees and fruit trees. It's a matter of incorporating this other society within the frame of English, um, you know, ideas and culture and so mm -hmm. forth. So I am not denying that Cook was a, was a very important uh, figure of the European Enlightenment and he had a, a, the Prospero side to his persona. But I am saying that's not all there is. There's a dark side to the Enlightenment, you mm -hmm. see, which we know now today, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a dark side to the Enlightenment and Cook represents what I also call the Kurtz persona. Mm -hmm. That is the, the person who goes into this foreign land, you know, and, and, and gets in some sense corrupted, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I show the two aspects of the Kurtz persona. In the Kurtz from uh, Heart of Darkness. Heart of yeah. Darkness. Yeah. I mean, so on the one hand, he's bringing in the enlightenment, the light in some way, and on the other hand, he's bringing in the darkness, you see because the way he treats the natives and so forth. So that part of the Cook enterprise has been smothered in the representations, scholarly representations, the popular representations. So what I do is to read between the lines, read the footnotes that others have uh, you know, used, and bring that to the surface. Mm -hmm. So when Cook, the, the, the crux of the issue is that when Cook went to Hawaii, the way that European scholars, some very distinguished ones, um, uh, present it is that he was treated as one of their gods, you mm -hmm. see, the god Lono, because he was called Lono. But then I point out, that that's the title of the book, European Mythmaking in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. I, the whole thrust of the book is to show that this is a European myth. And myths are, after all, not just the prerogative of us in the third world, so to speak, but Europe too is mm -hmm. a, it's a great myth-making culture, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. we know that. I mean, even now, as we are here, yeah. you know, it's myths that are being created about, about wars and so forth. So what I try to show in that is the idea that the white civilizer is a god to natives is a structure of the long run in European thought. Mm -hmm. It comes in Columbus, mm -hmm. it comes in Cortez, and it comes in Captain Cook. And, I, and I, my argument uh, was to show that they did treat Cook with great respect on the model of one of their chiefs, you know. The, uh, they bowed before him and so forth. They did that to their chiefs too, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no evidence in Cook's journals and the journals of, of, of the writers uh, on board ship that he was deified at all. But there is definite evidence that soon after Cook's death that there was, there were pantomimes in Covent um, Garden, you know, in which Cook was deified by the Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. So that was a European construction, so to speak, even before the first ships went back to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So my argument, therefore, is that uh, the, the, uh, not just to point out the dark side of the Enlightenment project, particularly in respect of the voyages of discovery, but also to show European myth-making mm -hmm. at its peak, you see, mm -hmm. where 
uh, Cook is transformed into the, a god for natives, you know? Now, uh, your new book is, is called uh, Imagining Karma. It was published uh, by uh, UC Press, uh, and you spoke about it in, in yesterday's uh, uh, lecture. What, what was the, the problem that you were trying to address here? Well, I can put it in this way. See, all of us intellectuals, myself included at one time, we imagine that theories of reincarnation, you know, is an Indic phenomenon. All of us think, well, you know, we associate that with Buddhism and with Hinduism and with the religions of India. And few people, of course, uh, who are very well versed in the classics know that Pythagoras and so forth also had that. But basically, it's an Indic thing. Mm -hmm. And even there are scholars who say that Pythagoras borrowed it from India, you know. So, you know, in the course of my reading, and my anthropological experience, I, I began to question that whole thing, you know. So the book was, the, the spur that led to the writing of the book was to expand the notion that the ideas of rebirth is not an Indic phenomenon. Mm -hmm. To decenter India, to delocalize India as the home and ground of rebirth. And to show that it is found uh, in a recent book um, uh, called Amerind uh, Amerindian Rebirth, uh, younger scholars have shown that Northwest Coast Indians and other Indians had beautiful circular theories of rebirth where the soul goes round and round and comes back to the same patrilineal or matrilineal group. It's beautifully circular systems, you know. And then we know from West Africa, from Igbo, which I describe in great detail, and other West African cultures, they too had theories of rebirth. And the locus classicus, you know, Malinowski, our great ancestor after all, wrote the Trobrian Islands, um, the religion of the Trobrian Islands. And that's, a, again, a wonderful system of rebirth theory, you see. So this led me to um, argue that, um, you know, that, um, uh, led to a kind of theoretical argument, trying to make the point that whether you are in ancient Greece or in ancient India or current present-day India, or whether you are dealing with what I call small-scale societies, nowadays it's very unfashionable to use primitive and tribe and all of that, you know, um, there is in rebirth a kind of elementary structure. That is, if you have a rebirth theory, you have the soul coming from some, some sphere, born into the womb of a woman, conceived there. One is then born in the human world. You go around the life cycle, you die, you enter into another world, you come back, and you have a cyclical structure of continuity. You know, it goes round and round. It doesn't matter where you are. It may be Plotinus, it may be Empedocles, Pindar, Pythagoras, doesn't matter, or the Buddha, or the Jain saints, or Amerindians, that elementary structure is there. Mm -hmm. And any other system, so to speak, whether you are talking about Greek uh, rebirth or Plato, I think contrary to some of my classical friends, I believe that re uh, Plato was a real was not writing uh, his stuff on rebirth as allegory, as many people think, but he really believed in it, you know. So whether you are Plato or whether you are the Buddha, and, and these are very powerful thinkers, they have to build their system of thought on this elementary structure. Mm -hmm. This permits, in some sense, comparison, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So since this permits comparison, I'm sort of arguing against a dominant trend in my own profession and in postmodernism in general that everything in the world is fragmented. You see, uh, relativity, um, re cultural and ethical relativism is everywhere. And I'm saying, yes, it is everywhere, but it is also not, you know? And you take these structures and you, uh, and you, and you can demonstrate the uh, existence of um, uh, comparability in cultures. So that was a 
That doesn't and, and so what, what, what I hear you're saying, and again, I'm not an anthropologist, so, so uh, for, for the, the lay person, you're saying that the, what, what you're discovering on the one hand is a kind of universalism, uh, in this case, the rebirth uh, uh, story that appears in all sorts of places. But on the other hand, there is a richness in the particular setting exactly. in which this occurs. And so the, the job of the, the analyst, in your case the anthropologist, yeah. is to see that, but, but on the other hand, dig out the, the local story and the way it's played out in, in that uh, system. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of my argument. The part of my argument is that on the one hand these things are comparable on one level because they share this elementary structure, you know. Mm -hmm. You have to build, so to speak, complex system of thought and Buddhism is a tremendously complex system of thought, you see, on these structures. Therefore, once these systems of thought are constructed, obviously Buddhism is different from Greek culture, it is different from Amerindians. Mm -hmm. But even so, even at the level of complexity, there are uh, some interconnections, you know. Uh, you can't avoid them, you know. So, uh, so that is why I, I always say I'm both a, uh, a relativist and an anti-relativist in some sense, you know. One final question. If, if you were to advise students who wanted to do this kind of work that you have done in your career, what advice would you give them uh, in terms of preparing for the future? Well, one advice that I give them is not to be seduced by current trends, you know. I mean, um, to put it in this way, that nowadays when I read a PhD dissertation, uh, it is not, I mean, people have to use uh, Foucault, for example, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, virtually every dissertation I read has something to do with Foucault. I mean, I'm saying, I myself believe that Foucault was a wonderful person, um, uh, a great thinker and so forth. But I'm also saying that one cannot be seduced to that degree. And uh, like me, for example, um, I very much admire Foucault, but I like to go back into Nietzsche, you see, with uh, whom, uh, I mean, after all, the will to power was not Foucault's invention, it was in some sense Nietzsche's invention. And in my way of thinking, though Nietzsche was not as systematic a thinker, we all know that, uh, as Foucault was, but there's a damn sight more insight in Nietzsche's thinking about the will to power, the creative aspect of the will to power, the destructive aspect of the will to power. So I'm saying uh, uh, to s uh, some of, uh, you know, uh, uh, to address your problem, I would say that one should not be seduced by current fashion, you know, one should approach current fashion uh, critically and one should not dump the past entirely because after all, in some sense, you know, all of us are creatures um, of tradition, you know, and to dump the past, to dump Freud, to dump Weber and so forth, uh, in my view, is a mistake. I mean, I, one should adapt Freud, one should rethink Freud, one should rethink Weber, bring perhaps Freud and Weber in line with postmodernity to some degree, you know, but um, I don't think one should be seduced by um, current fashions. I mean, that's, that's my thought on the matter. Uh, with that note, I want to thank you very much for, for joining us today and, and for coming to the campus to give the Forster Lecture. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.